right, you happily miserable accursed. Welcome to The Curse of Politics, the only political pod in Canada that gives you all the insights from the people who've been in the meeting after the meeting. And when the moment strikes, combines it with a pretty fucking killer Mulroney or Cretchen impersonation. I'm David Hurley, here with your ever-loving political panel, Scott Reed, Jordan Leitz, and Corey tonight. We've got ourselves a full docket this week, team. We'll continue to pick up the pieces of political shrapnel from Trudeau's selective pausing of the carbon tax. Speaking of Mr. Trudeau, Susan Delacourt wrote a bit of a thing in the Toronto Star yesterday on his slumping numbers and whether the Liberals have any kind of comeback path even without him. That's our cursed clipping. Then we'll head out west on Con Air and do a flyover of the Saskatchewan and Alberta Conservative conventions out there and finally the great Gordon Pinsent and our Hey Yous for the week. Corey, Jordan, Scott, anybody got a good story from the weekend? Jordan, come on, fire us up. Oh my God, no, I just did yard work. It didn't snow. That's my good story. I got to do my yard work, not in the snow. Um, and for once, no one in my house is sick. So just knocking on, knocking on everything. These are the joys of, of November. Jesus. Well, I, I was unpacking boxes all weekend because we're, you know, it, on the back end of a never ending move of two condos into one condo. Scott, where is Corey right now? Uh, well, I think that's a prison, but not on Earth. It seems to... <laughs> that's just you mode. So. I'm no, pretty I certain those are Rodman. Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. You need to see messy boxes in the back. Look at yeah. that. It's a facade. <laughs> it's I'm shocked. Jesus Christ, you were so <laughs> buttered up. This is uh, My broad, goodness. Broadcast Central at Rubicon Strategy, Inc. <laughs> Okay, Hurley and I are representing the sweatshirt crew on Monday morning. We're here for the regular people. Absolutely, I'm wearing my steady Imperial eighty t-shirt. megahertz of pro Ford subliminal advertising just bursting through our screens now. Just I, I realize I recognize I lost my poppy this morning. I had one on when I left the house, but like they they leap off my jackets. What happens when you're from Saskatchewan style. is people take your fucking poppies all the time. That's wow. why you had to be legislatively protected. Your right well, to wear a poppy. About time that somebody need doing something for regular folks like me. Exactly, exactly. Speaking of regular folks like you, I don't know what your home heating costs are there, uh, Corey, but uh, you know probably I'm guess. <laughs> prob, prob, probably well, somewhat, probably somewhat higher than they than they ought to be. Listen, this issue that we talked about last week continues to roll along. Liberals continue to go out and defend their position that um, that they're not going to create any other exemptions to this. They're, the meeting, the FedProv meeting that was supposed to be about the CPP got kind of hijacked by some premiers to talk about this. And the unfairness of this car vote policy, Scott Moe was again on a uh, question period this weekend talking about it. The issue's not going away. Ford sent a letter to all of the uh, Liberal MPs from Ontario asking them to stand up for Ontario. So the issue's continuing to roll. Um, are we right, Jordan, that the Liberals are going to cave on this eventually? Or do they have a position that they can't hold? Oh God, no, they definitely don't have a position that they can hold. And, and, and like, I have to issue mea culpa because I said something nice about the liberals last week on the podcast where I said that this was a sign of life that they had, you know, that they were making a bold decision in terms of changing direction to try to reverse fortunes. And wow, I was super, you and wrong. Hurley were both dumb I enough to think this was a strategy. So wrong. There's this no isn't plan. a strategy. It's this is so an electrocuted worse. spasm. That's right. So, so it is not a sign of life. In fact, it is, it is the opposite. And, and I'm not sure even what part of this is worse. Uh, we, we, we can pick apart the many ways, but I think I'm going to, I'm going to stick on two that, that really jump out at me. And the first one is that this, uh, apparently has obviously come about because Atlantic caucus held a gun to Trudeau's head. Um, and now the, the statement from Trudeau that there will be no more car votes is because Gilbo is holding a gun to his head. So everybody is in charge of direction on this, except the prime minister. Although apparently, you know, he, he elected. Can I just to do jump this. in with a factoid? Can I yeah. jump in with a factoid? Cause one of the most important things I've heard about this, I heard on, not to promote the competition, Peter, but on Peter Mansbridge's show, where Chantelle Hébert asserted flat out, no questions asked, any further carve out and Gilbo quits. No questions yes. asked. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I'm not, I mean, we've, we've wondered uh, what, what, how he could sustain this. And, and the answer is that he clearly can't. And and I think that, you know, his threats to quit are not new, but I think are, are probably more immediate in this case than they would be. So the first thing that strikes me about this is that it's, it's really the worst of all worlds in that he is being directed in, in terms of negative choices by pressure from within his caucus, which is exactly why a letter from Ford to all the Liberal MPs in Ontario, where, as we talked about before, you know, I do think Ontarians begin to wonder what's the purpose of having quite so many Liberal MPs if uh, they're not getting goodies of a transactional nature, since apparently this government, that's how they want to do business. And the second thing that really stuck out to me is that all of the negative impacts of this politically, uh, and that includes the demand for further carve-outs, the fact that premiers in the prairies and BC and Ontario were going to come out making such demands, the fact that this was going to potentially unite opposition against the Liberals, Gilbo's threats, um, all of this was entirely foreseeable. And yet there appears to have been no issue management strategy coming from within the Prime Minister's office to deal with some of these impacts. And that's really scary. Like that's a capacity thing that should be incredibly alarming. If you make a call like this, you have to make it knowing full well what the next two, three, four steps are going to be to contain this and steer it back into favorable ground um, and to protect your principle. And apparently there's absolutely no uh, effort that's been made on that uh, that's been effective. And so I find that really, really shocking. Um, I think, you know, I'm I'm interested in what the NDP has done here, as we talked a little bit about last week. So they've elected that they're going to vote with the Conservatives on the motion this week. They don't care about the climate anymore either. Yeah, well, I actually don't see a whole lot of people crying about that. And I'll tell you the truth here, and it's smart. They can't be holier than the Pope on the carbon tax. When, <laughs> when the Liberals, when, when the high priest of the carbon tax, you know, Justin Trudeau, has made a decision to go out and start to chip away at that, why would the NDP carry water for that when a lot of the fights that they're going to have are going to be toe-to-toe -to -toe with Conservatives on affordability issues in rural areas? There was never going to be another outcome on that. And so I think the fact that that was obviously not foreseen by the Liberal leadership uh, is, is really concerning. And actually, it shows to me, too, that they don't entirely understand how these discussions happen or unfold within the NDP caucus. And that's a real vulnerability when they're so reliant on the NDP for a lifeline right now. And the last thing I'm going to say is that <clears throat> I'm I'm also struck by the choice of removing the carbon tax as as the the tool that that uh, that Trudeau picked for this because there were others, right? You know, we talked like you could have really just gone in on boosting um, rebates. You could have gone in on removing GST HST on home heating, which would apply across the country and would would by the way. Um, actually be scaled to income already, which is, you know, which is a smart thing to think about, you know, but instead, so we now have no low income energy efficiency program across the country. So if you're low income in Ontario and you heat on natural gas, well, good luck. Your energy poverty apparently doesn't matter to this government, but we're still spending money on energy efficiency things that will generally only benefit middle and upper income people because they're the only ones who can afford to put money out to do these type of retrofits. So this is from a policy perspective, this is also incoherent and it really misses an opportunity to go after a real irritant and a real problem within the carbon tax, which is low income uh, energy poverty. And they've they've dropped that entirely. So just a fail, uh, a fail on all parts and feeding regional resentment and showing just incredible weakness within the PMO. So Corey, the reason that I assumed last week that they that this was the first of many moves is because they've conceded the thing that they couldn't concede and sustain the tax, which is that it's an affordability problem. They've conceded that the tax exacerbates affordability issues, which they had up until this point denied vociferously, and many people were believing them. But now there is no now they've conceded the point themselves. So now they have to now they have to move. Now they have to move forward. Their only hope, Corey, really, is that the people of Ontario are unaware of this and don't care. Do you think they will be aware and will care? Uh, yeah, I think they are aware and I think they do care. And I'll say as bad as the numbers in the Coletto polling uh, are, uh, 
you know, we do a lot of polling in Ontario and Ford administration, and and it's you know we have it a couple points worse for Trudeau and a couple points better uh, uh, for Polyev. Uh, I think it's probably uh, it's probably more like twenty nine uh, to thirty nine or thirty nine to twenty nine, however you want to say it, uh, but with a like a, a ten point lead for uh, for Polyev. And I don't think this is helping because what's driving those numbers are concerns about interest rates, the economy, affordability across the board, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can layer on top of that regional fairness and uh, who is this government in terms of intent and motivation focused on? And you know, it's, it's easy to forget that one out of every two uh, seats in this government, 77 of them came from the province of Ontario. And you've got a liberal cabinet minister out there arguing that if you want to have a, an exemption, you should have more liberal MPs. Well, there's no place in the country that has more liberal MPs than Ontario. And uh, a hell of a lot of good that's doing right now. It's, uh, it's really delivering nothing except the fuzzy end of the lollipop consistently here, and especially on this issue. Um, you know, and I, I but it's not very that. Ontario to say it's not very Ontario to say fucking Atlanta Canada is getting something we're not getting. That's outrageous. It's well, not really depends, what, depends whether you're worried about paying your mortgage. Like, no. you know, what, you know, the reality of what's happening now and what's coming down the tracks this year is like four out of 10 mortgages are coming due this year. And the ability for people to refinance uh, is, is limited in this environment with pressure testing, with interest rates where they are, et cetera, et cetera. I, I noticed that over the weekend there was another uh, townhouse development in Vaughan that mysteriously burnt to the ground, even though it was three quarters done. And then another story in, in I think it was in the Globe, talking about how uh, people are walking away from $300,000 down payments on, on that kind of housing because they're underwater and they can't get financing. And you know, you add all these things up, and you can understand why the normal rules might not apply to this. People are a lot less magnanimous when they're worried about uh, their own housing situation, their own ability to put groceries on the table for their family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, if the Beatles were a contemporary band writing their genius songs today, would one of them have included the lyric, "Baby, you can charge my car"? Maybe. Or maybe I'm just stretching my obsession with the Beatles to find a hurly way in to talk about electric vehicles and how our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is helping to get more of them on the road. I've been on here for a few weeks now about TELUS investing, investing, and then investing some more in innovation and network technology to drive social purpose and the Canadian economy. Well, here's the latest. They've just partnered with Flow, F-L-O, Canada's biggest, broadest EV charging network. Right now, Flow enables more than 1.5 million charging sessions a month. With TELUS's connectivity and network solution support, the goals are threefold. More adoption of electric vehicles, more and more reliable charging sessions, a zero emissions transportation future. Getting into the details here, TELUS's innovative technology is going to provide real-time visibility on at least 60,000 of Flow's chargers in Canada and the U.S., including Flow's new ultra-fast charger. Remote diagnostics will be possible. If they reveal a charging station isn't working to its full capacity, a technician will be dispatched immediately to fix it. That improves EV charger uptime, the percentage of time a driver will arrive at a charging station, plug in their vehicle, and get a successful charge. So that's a peek behind the EV technology curtain, hurly-burlyites. Maybe all that EV jargon was more than you wanted to know. But know this, these are the kinds of investments and shared vision from TELUS and Flow that add up to a cleaner, more sustainable future. Borrowing the immortal words of Lennon and McCartney, to that I say, Beep, beep, and beep, beep, yeah! All right, Scott, I don't give a shit about the policy of this right now for the purposes of this conversation. Let's just talk about the politics. And you mocked me last week, and it turns out appropriately so, mocked me, although I still think I might turn out to be right just because the laws of gravity. I mean, so you're right that this wasn't a strategy. It turns out it was like a reflex. It was like a doctor hit their knee with a mallet and their leg jerked out or something. That's uh, that's kind of what it was. Um, but it remains um, the case that they are, you know, somewhere between 11 to 12 points underwater to the Conservatives, maybe more. And uh, this issue 
you know, even if nobody cared about the unfairness of it, like even if this remains a political problem in the rest of the country. Yeah. I think it's the most serious mistake they've ever made as a government. Um, and partly because of when it comes and the circumstances, obviously. I mean, you can afford to fuck something up and to bullshit yourself and to try to pull your way through a problem uh, when you've got a margin. When you don't have a margin, when you're um, when the margin is working against you. Um, I mean, they have unleashed with this, politically, they have unleashed a whole herd of forces, all of which work against them. So now they have, as you say, like they have, although they refuse to acknowledge it, they have conceded that the integrity of the carbon tax as an instrument of carbon, uh, Paul, or as, a, as an instrument of their climate policy, um, they've conceded the integrity of it. And so that's, that's happened. Now they're scrambling to insist it. So they've got all that problem. So they've lost the people that are hardcore for them on climate policy. Now, maybe they needed to lose those people, but they've lost them. They have not gained the affordability people because now they're still clinging like a dinosaur to a meteorite. They're still clinging to the carbon tax and insisting that it is, in fact, their policy. Um, so they've got that. They've unleashed federal, provincial forces that obviously work to their disadvantage and you can't just shrug your shoulders and say oh well daniel smith and scott moe are always going to try to run a rail up them yes they are but you've got eb and you've got ontario it's a giant fucking fed prof mess and internally as we're talking about around the cabinet table and within caucus it's a mess so you here's the thing that i hate most about this though I'm sure, David, you've gotten these calls where I get people who are watching me on TV and radio, but well, they don't always watch me on radio, but some people close their eyes and <laughs> squeeze you. their That's minds what and imagine what I look like in a tight T-shirt. And they say to me, God damn it, Reed, this is crap. We have actually had a, this was not targeted at Atlantic Canada. This is a general application of home heating oil. It's the dirtiest of all the heating forms. This is something we needed to incentivize people to get off of. And they get all pissy. And I say to them, hang on. Here's a meeting that didn't happen. A meeting that didn't happen is that this far into it, after the July 1st carbon tax took hold in Atlantic Canada, a meeting that didn't happen is that once their numbers went into the shitter in Atlantic Canada, a meeting that didn't happen was a meeting where around the prime minister's office, they said, you know what? We have to do something to get more heat pumps out there and we have to do something to wean people off of home heating oil. That is the principal problem that we are preoccupied with. Now, what is the policy remedy to that and how do we manage it politically? What did happen, there was a meeting and that meeting was, we are underwater in Atlantic Canada. It's the last region that we can reliably count on. Caucus, of which there are many from the Atlantic, are out of fucking, they're, they're out of their fucking minds. And we have to do something about it. So then someone, by way of briefing note or political improvisation, says, well, we can do this. And it doesn't actually breach the integrity of the carbon tax because we can say it's an incentive to get off of home heating oil, which by the way, doesn't make any sense because actually if you were going to incentivize them according to the rules of the carbon tax, you would jack the motherfucking thing through the roof. You wouldn't right. eliminate mm -hmm. it. But in any event, forget that cognitive dissonance. They then sit around and have that and then they persuade themselves. All right. Now, when we do this, Bo is going to go fucking nuts and we're going to lose some resources. So get on the phone to the stakeholders. We make the principle. And then they start to believe they're bullshit. And then you get the prime minister scrumming outside a cabinet like he did the other day where he looked like he was outraged to even be asked about this. And then it was an affront that they should be questioned about the politics of this when they're simply trying to do the right thing. This is bullshit. And when you say they can't sustain this position, they can't. They also can't sustain walking away from this position. They have put themselves in a corner that it surrounded themselves with barbed wire, and they're going to have to climb out, get cut in order to do it. And I really think, uh, this last thing I'll say, read Adam Redwanski's piece from the Globe and Mail this weekend. That is such a nightmare for them, not because of politics, but Adam Redwanski, who's been a forceful advocate for climate policy and rational politics, tried to implement it for years now, writes basically that having popped this issue, the truth of the matter is there are no carbon policy advocates anymore. There are no carbon tax advocates anymore. People are conceding that the tax is not an effective instrument to actually complete your climate policy. So now they don't, there's just no life preserver left to cling to. 
but they are out adrift in the Pacific Ocean of bad polling. And um, I, I, I think the only way out of this is to just say, we're going to do a full-on fucking retreat and take their, take their beating. Well, so well, as a segue, not, as a segue to our next thing, what the thing I'd like the three of you to opine on is let's go back to a further meeting that apparently didn't happen. What the fuck before the carbon tax came into effect in Atlantic Canada this summer? There must have been conversations where they were anticipating what would happen. Like what's happened to the instincts of a political staff that would let it just roll into effect and have all the damage done because it's extremely unlikely that this rollback changes anybody's mind because the liberals are still telling you that the tax is coming back if they get reelected. So I don't understand even, I don't even understand why this is going to go ahead. Go ahead. Things are just happening to this government, to this prime minister. Things just happen to them. And this is fatigue. Uh, this is lack of uh, widely dispersed decision-making ability within the PMO, bottlenecks at the top. This is a manifestation of all of that. They spent their whole summer managing crisis after crisis. Like, I know it seems like an eternity ago, but remember, we went in to the summer uh, on, on election interference, right? We went into the summer on election interference, and then, and then they self-imposed the caucus shuffle that was poorly managed internally, they were entirely sucked in to these internal discussions. So I'm sure that there was one or two people who noticed it, but there's a wide gap between the ability of a staff person to notice that this is coming and that this might crystallize as a political problem and the ability to execute steering it off prior to that coming into force. I don't think they had the internal capacity to do it. And it's really telling the fatigue is now absolutely clouding the judgment and their ability to get in front of these things. And Trudeau's taking it all like a punching bag. Well, well you read it looks, Corey, like they had no plan, right? Well, I think it's, I think it's worse than all, all of that in the sense that for months prior to that, Polyev was doing advertising in Atlantic Canada, political advertising from the party around carbon tax, laying the groundwork for this narrative. Like the, this, this situation didn't just jump out of nowhere. This was coming down the tracks for a long time. You could see it. It was like literally on TV and on your computer and on your smartphone <laughs> and all of the all of these things. So I'm, I, you know, it, you can't ch chalk it up to you know suicidal Fucking decision making. God. I, th I, I think there are indications that that this government has just lost the will to live. Like it's like they woke up one morning and it's like you know what? I know I got to breathe. But I'm just so damn tired. I just can't. I can't. Can't bring myself to do it. Like it's 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 a death wish maybe, but it's a death wish through through fatigue and exhaustion and uh, uh, and and as as I think Jordan correctly pointed out, letting things happen to you, not reacting to to very obvious external stimuli. Uh, that in politics, if your opponent's running attack ads on you on a topic in a region, uh, you got to respond. You can't just sit there and and wish it were otherwise. Like you got to actually get up off you know out of your lazy boy recliner, put down the remote control, you know, dust off your running shoes, and go out and start knocking on doors or doing something. But like, you know, what what they've opted to do instead is, I think, the, the single worst thing they could could do politically, which is to, to chop their own legs out from underneath them on, on what had been a central narrative of the government. They've just abandoned it. Except yeah. they haven't abandoned it. No, that's, see, that's the I point. Mean, I actually would do that. I actually at this right. point think that whatever bad day is when they cut loose the carbon tax, it's not as bad a day as the day they lose the election with 70 seats. So... It's, I would do it, but they're not doing it. Well, but they're not going to do it under under Trudeau. Uh, and I think it's still an open question as to whether or not he sticks around. Because I don't know if you want to get into the polling numbers or, or, or Susan's piece, but, you know, you, you lift up the hood of that polling and there's only bad news followed by worse news followed by apocalyptically bad news. Uh, well, you know, the the underlying numbers are 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 way worse than what the top line numbers are, and the top line numbers are as as I think Scott aptly put a couple of months ago, uh, break glass. It's an emergency, you know, bang on the on the pipes in the submarine. Like it's mm -hmm. it's that bad, but you know, under the hood, it's even worse. And not to steer us to policy again, but just to briefly say, there are things that this government could be articulating 
on climate change that shift away from carbon price. And, and like, you know, we, we look at overall what's happening in terms of emissions in Canada. There are other things driving reductions now. They could focus on that. They could focus on dealing with energy poverty. They could focus on helping people to kind of pay their bills. There's a lot of things that they could do to recast climate action in a much more favorable light during the affordability crisis. It would just require some creative thinking and a bit of turning the ship around, but there doesn't seem to be any capacity to do it. And that's after them having sunk so much political capital into climate as a legacy issue for the prime minister. It is baffling. Well, I'll, I'll, well I'll let's not run on energy poverty. Okay, I don't like well, that label. No, too no, much, but, not to say to run so, on it, but to say if can, you want to recast it, I don't want to run on smart. climate. I don't want to run on climate. It's no. a loser issue. So, sir, this is the problem. So, let's come back to this. It away. The original sin, the original sin is the carbon tax. The original sin is saying that we are going to make climate policy yes. contingent upon the litmus test of carbon tax, mm -hmm. knowing that it was not politically sustainable. Or at least being able, if you wanted to be honest with yourself, to foretell that it might not be politically sustainable and probably wouldn't be politically sustainable. And that it need not be central and vital to your policy approach. And so that's the original sin. And what it meant was that politically they were guaranteed to either cut one leg off or a couple of legs off. And now because they've waited and waited and waited until... They got to this point, they're cutting off two legs, but now they are still pretending that they can run. And it just doesn't work. The worst of and all worlds. So I feel when, like they're when, cutting off the, the one leg between their ankle and their knee and then trying to sew the foot onto the knee. Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're beating the living on one piss leg, on you. And, and then the they're going to run a race. Like the only thing uh, I would say just by way of, uh, like, I do think, you know, this is an, a relentless savaging of the prime minister's office. Those people didn't get stupid. And I know everyone likes to say, oh, they're tired. And I know I got tired when I was in a prime minister's office and I was only there for 17 and a half minutes. But listen, the reality is that they didn't get stupid. And I don't think the fatigue explains it. And it may be that new blood doesn't mean you have to kill everybody else, but maybe adding some voices helps. But I think it is the obstinacy of incumbency. That has a big part to do with that. The walls of Langevin grow and they grow higher the longer you're there. And it's harder and harder for people to scramble over them and say, that won't work. That thing you guys are meeting and talking about, it will not work. But the obstinacy of incumbency means you sit around that table and you say, and that's right. And we'll square the circle by telling people it's about home heating. And by God, it is about home heating. And, and by the way, we won. We ran on the carbon tax in 2015, 2019, 2021. We won all of those. We have done. been endorsed. Yeah. Our carbon tax. That's right. It won. We won. Done. Oh, and we thought, me. David, in 2018 that gas plants uh, were over. Well, but you know what? They can <laughs> crawl out of the motherfucking cemetery but, but, and strangle you. But two things have happened since then. There's it's one thing to run on a on a carbon tax back in 2015 in abstract. It's another thing to have one actually implemented right. and have people actually experiencing what that is. Because it's no longer an abstract notion at that point. It's something that's real, and you're seeing what the impacts are. And you're seeing them in two ways. And this is ultimately what I think the Rudwanski piece uh, speaks to. One is it's a lot more painful for some people than others and and, and in ways that they didn't and no one ever explained or, or made them aware of in prior to being brought in. And number two, it's not fucking working. Like it'd be one thing if we were hitting all of our climate targets and you could actually point to the policy, uh, the policy as having the outcomes that it said it was going to have. But when you look at those interviews that Rodwanski did with, with people in the environmental community, it sort of seems like it was about a 50-50 proposition as to whether people would stand by the policy as being effective anymore. And for those who did, uh, it was a, a, a lukewarm, uh, in some circumstances, maybe helping a bit, uh, it's sort of a diagnosis of, of, the, of the outcome. So, you know, people are feeling it now, that's different, and it isn't fucking working. And that's So, not so what, what do you do? What do you do? And here's what I would do. Here, honest, because there's no, it's shitty or fatal, right? Those are your choices. You don't have good. Good is off the table. You removed good a long time ago and you made it absolutely impossible this last month. Adam Redwanski's piece is a roadmap. If I was working in the prime minister's office, I'd say you now have to create, you had a moment, you had a David Hurley identified moment where you could have said, it is with reluctance that we must conclude that we have to, you could have used that as a step 
that then allowed you to take another step to walk away from the carbon tax and say that. They've now blown that moment. They need to create a new moment. If I was working in the prime minister's office, I would take the Adam Redwanski piece and I would go ding, ding, and I would get a series of climate advocates that have been on board particularly from a market perspective, to write an open letter to the prime minister and say carbon pricing need not be, right? You can't die on this hill. You're now putting the climate agenda at risk for this incoherent, hobbled carbon pricing regime. You've got to stop it. You've got to move off of that. Then they take that, they take that and they hold a news conference and they say, guys, in light of this kind of voice and the concerns that we've unleashed from a FedProp perspective, and we may have been upset and resistant about it, but nevertheless, chomp, chomp, chomp on my shit sandwich, we are moving away from it. And then they've got to try to manage the gibos of the world internally, and if they can't, they lose them. But there is no, like gibo, for example, just use it as a symbol, I don't even know if this rumor is true, but retaining gibo is not a sufficient justification no matter how significant a household name he is in, in Quebec, for maintaining this course. You got to move off of it. You must create a movement. It's your job in the prime minister's office to say, as unpleasant as it will be, this is how we create the moment for us to logically wheel off of this. And they got to do it. And then they have to manage it. And I don't know that it's a given that they can't manage and stare down Gibo. And if they can't, well, fuck him, man. He's not the prime minister and... He's not all of Quebec, and I'm not convinced that Quebec will actually vote one way or the other based on Gibo and a carbon tax. Can I just all say right, let's that, move, let's that, move. that losing losing a carbon tax and losing Gibo, that's the kind of shit that I, I wake up with a huge smile on my face when I think <laughs> that, that world. Like, that sounds like a win-win for Canada right there. <laughs> They've got to get out of this box. So, those of you who faithfully listen to this pod will remember Kathleen Wynne's decision at the height of an Ontario election campaign five years ago to tell voters, sorry, not sorry. It was a mea culpa flipped on its head. She acknowledged complaints about governance, then pivoted to say she was not sorry for a list of things she was proud of accomplishing as Premier. The underlying message of the ad was, please folks, dial it back a bit. Things work pretty well in Ontario. There are far worse places to live. Well, our sponsor, CN, thinks that might be a good way to think about Canada's supply chains. Granted, there are all sorts of players who spend all sorts of time and money trying to convince governments that Canada has calamitous problems. But usually it's self-interest. They want a more lucrative deal for themselves. The fact is, Canada's supply chains work exceedingly well when considered against chains in other parts of the world, which have been staggered by Russia's war of aggression in Eastern Europe and are still recovering from the disruptions of the pandemic. And CN is pretty darned proud of keeping our supply chains moving. It has shown itself capable of moving 700,000 metric tons of grain out of the prairies in a single week. That's close to a million acres worth of product. Any way you cut it, that's an impressive feat especially when you consider that Canada's rail freight rates are among the lowest in the world, lower than Japan, India, most of Europe, and, yes, the United States. CN constantly plows revenues back into its network, ensuring trains can move through summer and winter weather, keeping operations safe, making sure shipments leave the station and arrive on time. It costs a lot of money, but it's money well spent. Do delays happen? Sure. Things like catastrophic weather events and labor disruptions are out of a railway's hands. Stuff happens. But otherwise, you know, sorry, not sorry. Quite the opposite, in fact. All right, let's move on to our clipping because it flows quite directly from this. And Susan Delacourt um, has been working with David Coletto at Abacus Research and using Coletto's polling to, as the basis for her columns. And she did that she did that again this uh, this weekend, and the numbers are getting pretty dark, and Susan's having a hard time not writing pretty dark things about them. Um, so here's where she went. It is the question haunting Justin Trudeau's liberals as their fortunes continue to slump. Is there a comeback path? More to the point, if one exists, is it with Trudeau or without him? David Coletto, CEO of Abacus, did not mince words. Trudeau stepping down might help bring some people back to the liberals, but that's not a silver bullet. It doesn't solve all the problems, he said. The data suggests there's very little the Liberals can do to make themselves more electable at the moment. Enough people have decided they want change. A full 77% of past Liberal voters 
who now report negative impressions of him say they are tired of Trudeau. 91% say he's inauthentic, and 82% say he makes promises he can't keep. Among these former Liberal voters, even more believe Trudeau got Canada into the mess it's in. Liberals have been counting on the idea that the more people see of Poiliev, the better Trudeau will look. It has become common to say in Liberal circles that Trudeau may be unpopular, but he's the best bet to beat Poiliev. Abacus' latest polling introduces some doubt to that theory. Coletto puts it this way, First, far more people think Poiliev and the CPC will win the next election than think the Liberals will. This is a big change and indicates the public is coming around to the idea that the Conservatives are going to win. This is a problem for the Liberals because even though people think the CPC will win, it hasn't impacted their vote. Polyev isn't a threat to people. So there you go. Thank you, Susan, for continuing to uh, explore this work with David. This was a, another interesting data set. Listen, folks, the something broke about the government's relationship with Canadians this summer. And this went from we entered the summer into in a dead heat and it has now become a blowout over the course of the last uh, couple of months. And this has changed the whole tenor of the conversation around Trudeau. Now, it remains the case that there is literally, and, and you know, people think we're spinning when we say this, but Scott, honest to Christ, I can detect no movement of any kind, uh, nor do I see anybody with the authority, strength, or heft to make any kind of move on the guy. So I think the ball remains and will remain completely in the prime minister's court about this. But of course, with these shitty numbers, the chances of him stepping down before the election increase and increase. And so people start to speculate when he'll do it and who might replace him and all that. And then you've created your own dynamic that becomes, of course, self-fulfilling. Um, Scott, if you're in the PMO, how do you turn this talk around? I mean, it's not threatening, but it's debilitating. It's very debilitating, and it's there's only one answer, and that's to restart yourself and put some W's on the board. They can be tiny W's, but just something. Um, and right now, literally from nuts to soup, every piece of news that flows out of Ottawa is bad. And as everybody else here has said, every event that occurs seems to occur at the disadvantage and to the uh, detriment of the government. So um, I... Uh, you know, there's a little bit of a roadmap in Coletto's um, numbers. They're not not a complete roadmap, but he says, "Listen, uh, if he he asked people that voted liberal in 2019 what it would take for them to vote liberal again, and there were a couple of categories of things. A category of thing that you can't control, like interest rates come down and the economy improves. All right. Well, the only thing about that that you can control." is not making it worse and making certain that you extend that agreement with the NDP so you buy yourself time for those macro conditions to emerge. But there's another category of things which I thought were interesting, and they're limited. They only take you so far, but they get you somewhere, which is those people would be more likely to consider voting liberal again if, one, they were convinced that Paul Yev was going to be prime minister, and two, if, and this is fascinating the way this is phrased, if they were uncomfortable about Paul Yev being uh, Paul, uh, Prime Minister, which is to imply that, that that cohort of liberal, past liberal voters is not inherently and instinctively certain that it would be uncomfortable for them to see Polyev as um That as was Prime the one Minister. place where I thought David's analysis went a little far there because there's no facts in the future. And the case against Polyev, as we bemoan here every week, has not been prosecuted. So to me, that's the beginning Right. I think you, A, you have to stop doing things that don't work for you. So they've got to get out of this carbon tax box, no matter how brutal it is. Um, and that means walking away from it and taking and suffering the consequences and giving themselves an opportunity to say, all right, now look at us through a new lens. And I think they have got to. I don't know what the problem is. Like, I, I like if it's if it's hubris, then it needs to vanish. If it's money, then get a fucking loan. But they have got to do paid media that tell people this motherfucker is going to be prime minister, and he's going to burn your barn to the ground. They have to do that. I do not exaggerate in my mind at this time how much room that picks up for you, but it will pick up some room presumably, and it will provide you with something to rally troops, and then you're able to look and say now is there a forward strategy from there but right now they've got to stop digging and second they have to like hammer the other guy do those two things see if that gets you somewhere back to sea level uh, and if not then quit so you know it feels you guys like 
so much so much is defensive now. Like, are the Liberals giving you any reason to vote for them? Or are they spending all of their time telling you that the reasons to vote against them aren't as bad as you think? We're not as bad at housing as you thought we were. We're not as bad on the carbon tax as you thought we were. Like, it's, it's backpedaling all the fucking time and backfilling all the time. Well, and this is what's really striking because I feel like in some ways we could transport this conversation to last spring when all the signs were that the affordability crisis was what was driving voters' concerns and voting intentions. And we spoke then with urgency about the Liberals refocusing in tangible ways around making a difference in people's ability to pay their bills every month. And that has not happened. And I find that it's really striking because to me, when I, you know, when I look at Coletto's numbers here, it's the affordability crisis, stupid, is the top line here. You have people, you have 60% of past liberal voters saying that if interest rates come down, and so that's month to month pressure on their mortgage, that's concern about, about uh, renewing their mortgage then they might consider voting liberal. Like, like your answer is in there, right? People are feeling the crisis right now. And while I agree that Sean Fraser has been out there doing far, far better work on the housing file than anyone has done in this government before him, it's not enough because that is all future oriented. That is all stuff down the road. That doesn't help people dealing in the immediate and sending polite letters to grocery CEOs and wagging a finger at them about prices whilst discovering that things like grocery flyers exist, also not enough. So they have not used this time to change their tone or their approach in any true measurable way to actually deal with the nut of the issue. I think Scott's right. This makes the NDP support and the time that they need to buy even more crucial. So that cost, though, is going up and up and up for the NDP, because as the Liberals fumble and mishandle all these other things, and this carbon tax is like a crystal clear example of it, when you drop the ball in affordability, like there's a risk that they may pull the NDP down along with them. And so the NDP is going to be looking to create more and more space from them if that's what they continue to do for for very obvious reasons, right? So they've got a real problem here. And I think the other thing that strikes me about this, and I think Paul Wells really crystallized this in his piece over the weekend, which is just, by the way, scathing on Carney and, and everyone should go have a read because it's, it's very, it's very well written, but we still don't know why Trudeau wants to stay. And it's not clear that he knows the answer to that question either. And I have long argued that reaching back as recent or as far back as 2019, there wasn't a clear raison d'etre for this Liberal government. There wasn't a clear, you know, coming out of that 2019 election, if COVID hadn't happened, what would the narrative of that government had been? I'm not sure that they would have had a clear one. So I've they said have it before, yet- I'll say it again. Jerry was the only one who knew what it was about. Right. And and they have yet to figure that out. And frankly, the prime minister has to decide whether he wants to fight or not, whether he's in it. And until that happens, I don't think anything can turn around. But the the levers that are in front of them to turn things around are obvious. They remain the same as they were six months ago. No one's grabbing for them. And that's what should be really concerning for that team there. Corey, maybe this is unfair. Maybe this is unfair. But you were part of a government that ran out of gas toward 10 years, ran out of energy, stumbled into an election it was bound to lose without knowing that. What lessons did you take from that experience? Well, I think it was, there were lots of signs that we were going to lose the election. Um, We'd spent like eight months stuck at 30%. And no matter what we used to try to to, to change that number for us, uh, you couldn't. And anything anyone tried to do to bring our number below 30 basically didn't work either. We had 30% of the electorate uh, locked up, like completely. But we couldn't get like a point more than that. And if you look at the results in 2015, there was one line that was flat and it was conservative support. And then you had a competition on the progressive side of the ballot as to who was going to replace the government. But basically the biggest driver was, you know, who can beat Harper and whoever that is, whatever concerns I have of them are secondary to beating Harper. And and that's really, I think, what, what happened in that election campaign. But yeah, there were signs that that was coming down the tracks. Um, I want to go back to that Coletto poll a little bit because, you know, I want to build on some, some of the stuff that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Scott pointed out. 
because I do think there's a roadmap there. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I thought was the second most interesting thing in the poll, which was uh, looking at NDP supporters and what would get them to vote liberal, because uh, there's a lot of bad news there for Jagmeet, I got to say. And, and it reinforces what the path is, uh, I think, for Trudeau. But when you're looking at, at you know, the liberal supporters and what moves them the most, uh, it's you know mortgage interest rates started to drop. Canadian economy impl- improves. Like those are those are right up there, right? But you know a third of the people it's having Trudeau leave. So here's here's a plan. Uh, Bank of Canada even says you're going to see a drop in inflation, uh, a one-time deal if you get rid of the carbon tax. That's smart to do. It'll bring inflation down. You could change the target rate to three percent. That would help with mortgage interest payments as well. Uh, and you could get rid of Trudeau. You add those three, three things together, and you've got life back in the body. Um, but what's also interesting is when you're asking ND, current NDP supporters, what would make you open to, to uh, supporting uh, 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 the Liberals? A third of them say if Trudeau left as leader. So you know, you lose Trudeau, you gain uh, potential upside with NDP voters. But uh, also, uh, it's the same things. It's improve the economy, bring mortgage interest rates down, all the same stuff. But then you add into that, but one out of two of them say, I'll look at switching my vote if it looks like Polyev's going to become prime minister. Well, it does look like Polyev's going to become prime minister. So I think you add that up, and there's like a, a very compelling argument to be made to drop the carbon tax, drop Trudeau, and, uh, uh, and make a change uh, at the Bank of Canada to give some mortgage interest relief to people. You do those three things, I think you've got, you know, well, you've left out you've left out the most important one. Those are all three important, but you've left out the most important one, which is they have to peel the paint off of Polyev. Yeah, I well I agree, but part of that paint I think peels off itself because, you know, part of what those numbers are saying is the more people think that who are progressive voters that Polyev's going to win, the more they are likely to look at at supporting the party because they want to stop that. Yeah, but so, don't you think that he's becoming normalized? I mean, I that was part of what normalized. Susan said in her piece, that the I, idea of Polyev mm. as a prime minister is so much more just part of the accepted discourse than it was two years ago. Well, and I think, once again, that's not by accident. I think there's been a very concerted effort to introduce Polyev to Canadians in a favorable way, a way that I think uh, it appears genuine and, and resonates with those voters. And that's why you're seeing his numbers go up. Like, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's just in all of the numbers that it, he is becoming a more acceptable option. You look at his positives are going up, his negatives are going down. What does that uh, coincide with? It coincides with what I think was a very well-crafted, very smart advertising campaign to introduce him to voters. Now, uh, the Conservatives got to introduce him to voters before the Liberals uh, because the Liberals let him. And, uh, you know, this is another example of just sort of you know, sitting in the lazy boy recliner uh, and, uh, and letting things happen to them that, that you don't have to let happen to you. But, so I agree like, with Corey about the negatives on Polyev, but I will take that bet on liberal leadership because if, if the alternatives are any indication, there is absolutely no guarantee that whoever the liberals would select to replace Trudeau in such a short time horizon would be anything except equally insidery and out of touch the concerns of regular Canadians. And I think that, you know, if 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 Carney is going to be one of the leading voices on that, I don't think that this sets them any further ahead on some of their major. Why? What's your issue? Challenges. What's your issue with what's your issue with him? Look, I think Carney's a really smart guy. And I think I think he's probably very appealing to a lot of liberals who want to lend some fiscal heft to the government. I sense a butt. You sense a butt. I, you know, I like, I like his haircut. Coming? I, think I don't think that fit. Mark Carney There's all sorts of things I like about a grocery him. flyer every week. I don't think that Mark Carney worries about how much it's going to cost to fill up his propane tank to heat his house in the winter. I think that a lot of the same tonal challenges that the Liberal government has faced under Trudeau and putting Freeland out in front to handle these economic issues would absolutely be echoed. And not just, I don't want to pick on Kearney because it's not just about Kearney. It's any of the other potential replacements (coughs) that we see coming from within a Liberal party that has been entirely recast since 2013 as a vehicle for Justin Trudeau. They have been able to smother any true potential change coming from within and now the results are that you're left with like choosing tones of beige right which is not the right 
choice set coming in to the next election. They're, they're, they're bringing guns to a knife fight with any of these options. Well, he shares I think we're this, overlooking shares one other factor. He this one with, uh, with Jugmeat, though. It's which Rolex will match best with my $4,000 suit. He does share that, <laughs> that common well, maybe, Corey, dilemma every maybe, day. Maybe, Corey, but I, I also... Look, I, I, live, I live through the yeah. same hell that that is, but uh, that's why I can speak to it with such authority. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm, like, yeah. I'm not sure... I mean, I don't, I don't think it's terrible for Jimmy to look ready for government, right? Like, I, I think that that's read oh, differently. Oh, come on, crazy. 300... 364 days from today, the United States will elect a new president. And I know there's been a little bit of polling that says, oh, I have more confidence in Paul Yev than Justin Trudeau to handle it. I'm telling you right now, 364 days from now, we want to talk about what's going to happen that could upset everything we think and turn conventional wisdom right on its ear. The re-election of Donald Trump will break the world in about 50 pieces. And so I just, one of the pieces of advice I would have for Trudeau if I was doing talking to him is do a bunch of the things that seem sensible. Get rid of the carbon tax. Stop beating yourself up. Start attacking your opponent, making him wear who he is. Put all those things in place and then see what happens on November 5th 2024. And if Donald Trump is reelected, I think some of the cards in the deck get reshuffled. And that's not like, oh, it's a magic solution, rub a lamp and you get three wishes. I just think that you're an idiot if you don't think that it would blow up the whole wide world politically. And I think then you make an evaluation as to whether that provides a pathway or ingredients for you to be re-energized with a message and an agenda that people would cling to. And I do not believe that Polyev can absolutely relieve himself of the moniker of being uh, a, a potential ally of Trump. And I think you can maybe ha cause some harm there. Um, but I think my advice to the PM would be, you wait for that year. Do some smart things now. Take some tough measures. Some of those will be ugly and pleasant decisions. Do it now. Then we see what happens on November 5th. 2024, and very shortly after, like within three months, you got to make a decision because if you're going to bail, you got to bail then. And I know Percy Down won't like that because it's not February 29th and a walk in the snow and he gets to like Daniel steal the romanticized ending to his career like his father. But I think that is a timeline that makes sense because that is an event that I think we have to circle on the calendar. Sure, but it's also waiting for something externally to happen that you think might be helpful. Because I can make, waiting. I, I, I can do make a things. case for a lot of voters, including me, that uh, I would much rather have Polyev uh, staring down a Trump presidency and defending Canada's interests because I've looked at the. Uh, the, the current liberal government and prime minister basically step on every rake on the lawn when it comes to foreign affairs issues over the last year and a half. Uh, so I, I, I think yeah. there's not a lot of I think people will have an inherent and, anxiety you know, about how he'll conduct well, they himself. Well, they may, they may, but the guy who has, you know, uh, not exactly uh, uh, de demonstrated incredible chops when it comes to foreign affairs issues over the last year and a half, which is why when you ask people the question, who do you think is going to do a better job representing Canada abroad or dealing with a Trump presidency, people come back and say uh, that Polyev is. I okay. think there is a connection between A and B in terms of how people are evaluating those strengths and weaknesses in the two leaders. But when the menu I is go boiled Scott, shit, gotta... baked shit, roasted shit, I think that that event is something you could look at as a liberal and go, well, maybe, maybe, well, it might, maybe. It might shake the table, but not necessarily. I don't think it's it's something that necessarily shakes the table in in a way that is is going to be favorable to them based on what research is telling us today. Uh, I don't believe that research. So, Scott, I you're a significant think, arbiter for me now. Where are you right now on Trudeau? Like, if you could make this call, would he be our leader in the next election or not? Um, I'm sort of like Susan's column. I, I had had a rational justification for why he should remain. And I think the logic of that is starting to disintegrate. And so that's why I say... To, if I were advising him, and this would also reflect, I think, my personal inclination, because I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not jazzed by the likelihood that the alternatives would be able to be anything other than a bubble at the end of the government that then just gets hammered to the next election. My inclination would be take hard measures on these fronts, see if you can breathe a little bit of new life and rally yourself, consume and collapse some of that NDP vote, get yourself back into a fighting pitch at sea level. And then see what happens in the United States and whether or not you can use that as a springboard for um, to trigger people's doubts and anxieties and give yourself a brand new reason to be reelected. Because that's probably going to be the most important issue on a lot of people's minds. And, um, and uh, if we can move past economic distress, uh, which is a big if, 
You wouldn't have more confidence. You wouldn't have more confidence heading into the next year and a half to an election with Dominic LeBlanc than you do with Justin Trudeau. Well, I think Dominic. I think Dominic has all the tools, but doesn't have the desire. I, I mean, I you know he's a friend of mine, and I've been through this movie a little bit with him, and I think the world of the guy, and I think the world of his political talent. But I don't think he wants to be the. I think he's minister. becoming kind of an obvious choice. I don't know why he's not mentioned more often. I think he's the safest hands you could put the party in for an yeah. likely save the furniture election campaign. Mm. Well, and I haven't I, turned my mind to Melanie Jolie, uh, who I think is, there's some evidence she's growing uh, in capability, but. I, well, I, I, mean, be less I think a resuscitated be, yeah. Trudeau is a it, it could be a better option than those alternatives, and I'll, if not, I'll, I'll be it. absolutely unequivocal. I'm not going to be wishy washy uh, like you, Scott, on this. As a conservative, I desperately and deeply want Trudeau to stay. I think that is the very best thing for Polyev and a Polyev uh, camp a led campaign for the conservatives. Because I think Trudeau's negatives are so ingrained and so deep right now, uh, and they built up so much, I guess, brand equity in running against him and defining him in a way that I think is very favorable to the conservatives. You're better to have Trudeau stay, and uh, and I, you know, I think that's for conservatives the best outcome. And uh, uh, but, you know, but I could see why liberals, and I don't think it's just Percy Down uh, who would come to a, a conclusion that. Uh, that that's maybe not the right answer. Percy, Percy was Dan a lot less flexible. Percy Down has always believed nine years and you're out. That's been Percy's yeah, rule. I was going to say, I can I recall him known. being a forceful advocate for succession uh, in 2001. <laughs> right. I mean, look, I think that it's just reflective of the terrible choices that are in front of Trudeau, right? I would say on balance, he should stay only because I would not have any confidence that the, the Liberal Party is in a position right now to execute a leadership race that will come out with a leader who can make a clear messaging and, and strategic break from Trudeau and to do that without dividing the party fatally. I don't think there's enough time for that. I don't think it's I don't think it's in the DNA of the party to do that so quickly at the end of a government. So I think that they're left with bad options and the, the best bad option would be to keep Trudeau but actually make some hard decisions. But is that not also a self-serving uh, notion, though, too, when 40% of the people who are supporting uh, Jugmeet is tepid as that 18% is, if 40% of them say you get rid of Trudeau, I'll think about voting liberals? Well, yeah, of course it's self-serving, Corey. <laughs> the untested opportunity. <laughs> I hope you would expect nothing less. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> the untested I opportunity. I, I've, always been with, I, I've always been with Scott that Trudeau's really, you know, objectively a great campaigner. He brings energy sure. to the campaign stage. He's articulate. He can be passionate, can rally people. He's, he, you know, I mean, he's got the elements of what you want in a campaigner, but I just worry that he's past the point where anybody's listening anymore. I don't think he can persuade anybody. anybody. I'm very worried. Well, I mean, maybe they need to find that guy and find out if he's still around. Mm. So we're well, just, we're I, just again, arguing the about how badly the liberals are going to lose then, just to be clear. Well, the un the untested opportunity for renewal at the moment that's right, Corey. Yeah. At the moment, that is the that is the situation. The right. untested opportunity for renewal, and it's untested because we've never before in history had this particular medium to reach into to pull a celebrity star out of is podcasting, and that's why I think that when you're looking for a man who can give new juice to the Liberal Party, that can bring the country together and certainly heal the the party's rifts, it's David Hurley. No That's question. A long and game. I have, That's a long game, friends. And I have the agenda, which is, you know, legalizing weed was so popular, I'm going to make it mandatory. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like the you certainly, you've got the track record. No one can quarrel with your commitment. Sliding scale. That's right. We sent to your house. <laughs> All right. You know what? We don't have time to get to the conservative prairie conventions this week, but they were interesting. So I think we'll probably try to get back to them next week because there's a couple interesting bits there. But I think we got to move right into Gordon Pinson territory here. So, Mr. Pinson, please bring it home for us. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. All right. Scott, you got a hey you? I sure do. And I know it's been a hell of a beating for the Liberals today, but uh, just yet another example of where I think um, they are not acting sharply, strategically. Um, this meeting on the Canada Pension Plan that was pulled together, uh, Christian Freeland comes out of it, and she declares that 
she is going to ask the chief actuary to identify a transfer amount. Since 53% of the CPP fund, as per the wish of Daniel Smith, is clearly intolerable, she's asked the chief actuary to develop a number that is tolerable. What is the right number? And then she started talking about, and if you did it, these would be the mechanisms you'd have to do, uh, go through, the negotiations you would have to hold. And she talked about a provincial precedents and international precedents for it. Stop! Stop, for Christ's sake! <laughs> the CPP is a jewel! <laughs> Do not provide people with a roadmap to dismantle it. Do not tolerate the presumption that Alberta can just walk away. I know they technically have a right. I'm not quarreling with that. But you don't need to have a meeting, argue about the carbon tax, and then come out and say, we're going to provide them with a set of numbers and a set of processes that Danielle Smith can then argue are in fact the issue. Don't give her a wall to bounce the ball against. Maintain the onus. If she wants to break up the CPP and she wants 53% of the fund, fucking explain why and how to the people in, uh, in Alberta and the people across the country. Don't put the onus on yourself. Don't negotiate against yourself. I thought it was a ridiculously unstrategic move coming out of that meeting and just brutal. Well, the whole the whole way the whole meeting went down, Scott. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, Bethlen Falvey threw her a softball across the middle of the plate, and it was a dribbler to the shortstop. I mean, it, it like that that should have been a beating for Danielle Smith and a triumph for Christian Freeland, but it turned into anything but. Well, in part because the federal government uh, did their their carbon tax exemption for home heating oil in Atlanta, Canada, which the became room. the number one issue for Ontario and BC and everyone else to talk about. And they were going there to talk about one thing, and the topic changed as a result of that ass nine move. Yeah. That right, Corey, still didn't you, you had to say we're going to talk uh, to the chief actuary. Fuck the chief no, actuary. Hide I that do. guy under a blanket. It's I, ridiculous. I, I've got a I've got a hey you that'll uh, harken back to our time in beautiful New Brunswick, uh, where we oh, yeah. are live taping. Uh, so Premier Higgs has uh, selected a campaign manager, and it is uh, uh, my friend Steve. Drag Oda. queen. Steve, you know, it's not a drag queen. I don't think so. Anyway, uh, oh, that's his Steve, last Steve Outhouse, who is, uh, uh, I think, uh, credentials were good before he went out to Alberta to to run Daniel Smith's campaign, and only improved, uh, you know, incrementally that much more as a result of that election victory, and he's now being tapped for yet another important assignment in conservative world. Uh, which is to manage the campaign for Premier Higgs. So, uh, hey, Steve, uh, let's uh, let's go do it again, buddy. I want to see see another victory under your name. Alrighty, sure. specialist in corralling raccoons. So, <laughs> exactly what's called for. Uh, all right, my hey you this week. Um, I I had other thoughtful things I was going to say around foreign policy, but then I read this story. Yesterday, uh, this Ashley Burke CBC story, the headline, the liberals go online to test messages attacking Polyev's record. And I, I spat my coffee. And I just, I have to say, so my hey you is going out to to uh, our, 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 our punching bag this week, the, the Liberal Party and folks involved in that campaign. So in this in this piece, uh, Dan Arnold. To be clear, this is not at him. He's carrying water here, and 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 you see the awkwardness of a man working with very little in terms of spin, trying to make the best out of it, trying to spin the three measly videos that the liberals have done attacking Polyev uh, over a week and a half after the Apple video. So it's late. There's only three of these little videos. There's no money behind them at all. And, and the, the spin that's being given is that that's okay because, hey, these are talking points for family gatherings and they're going to boost MP morale. And so my hey you is to anyone involved in the liberal campaign who might maybe think that these words are at all true, uh, please pack it in. Go home because you're done. If you think yeah. that this is true, you are finished. Um, <laughs> Shoot, and and there's nothing we can do to help you because boosting MP morale and giving talking points to liberals for family gathering is not the fucking assignment. So that's my hey you. They're shooting BBs at an Abrams tank. It's yeah. not going to work. Jordan, Jordan knows wow. from deep and bitter experience how uh, ineffective 
videos without money behind them designed to get right. people talking at family gatherings right. and cheer Trust up me. MPs really are. Trust me, this does not work. <laughs> this does not work. Do not do this. And do not tell yourself it's anything other than loser land. Yeah, my hey, use quick. It goes out to the PMO. You're going to make further changes to the carbon tax. You're going to leave. Gil you're going to lose Gilbo. Get your head around this right now and map out a plan in which that turns to your political advantage rather than a backtrack every couple of weeks because these things are going to happen and um, do it deliberately. All right. Thank you for everybody who watched or listened today. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. You three, as always, delight my Monday mornings. Thanks for joining me for this chat this morning. And uh, everybody, hope you enjoyed this show, and we'll see you next week for more of The Curse of Politics. Take care of yourselves.